Hi, welcome back again to the TMCI Annual Conference. This is our last night. We're hoping that you have been blessed as much as we have been blessed. We still have people around the world watching each session. God really bless us with great sessions again today. I don't know about you, but I continue to be blessed and encouraged by the way that God's moving on the speakers. One of the things that TMCI is blessed with, however, is our team that helps minister to you. We have David Reinhardt, who is our office manager. David works with the membership and assists with the office team, Betra, is, uh, Betra Stocky and Judy Covington. Cheryl Coulter helps us with the communications, media, and conferences, and Jamie Wynn is my assistant. These are people dedicated to serve you and to help advance the kingdom of God. I also want to thank Cheryl media team, Nathan Tinsdale, Doug and Chris Wilson, and Matt uh, Grossman for making the conference a success. We have an, another office person that I call off campus. His name is Bishop Mike Swearinger, who is our prayer coordinator. There, he's the one that oversees a, the uh, people that, the hundred prayer wires that pray for your prayer needs when you send in your monthly reports. If you are interested in being part of the TMC prayer warrior team, please email us at office at tmcimissions.org. In, in the subject line, just put uh, prayer warriors. We can never have enough prayer warriors. The, one of the, way, the main reason that TM says it's successful it is now is the amount of prayer that is put into this ministry. And those prayer warriors are such a needed backbone for this nation, uh, for this country, and also for TMCI. So please remember to join us for our three internet conferences during the month, the first, second, and third Mondays. And uh, again, go to our website for information how to join us there. Also remember World Prayer on the last Monday of the month. Uh, it starts at 9 p.m. Eastern time. And we take it again, we are praying for our missionaries and, and this kind of pandemic is going on. They are suffering just as long with the people in foreign lands. And so we, they need our prayers support and we need to be praying for their countries too. So st stop by and visit us on Facebook uh, after the conference. It's our Facebook address is www facebook.com slash the missionary church international this by the way has become our, our bulletin board where we we keep up upcoming events and meetings on there and so it's a good way to find out what activities are happening also visit our website www.tmciworld.com to see any new things that what are happening in tmci new projects and things like that so as the pandemic lifts, remember, if you would like to have a regional meeting, please let us know. You can email us at office at tmcimissions.org. I also like to give you a special invitation tonight, something very special. You're invited to stay on Facebook and see us concentrate uh, Jerry Bauer and Gabriel Gilpin as TMCI bishops. It's a very special service and we welcome all who would like to, to see it. And uh, we just praise God that God has given us another two exceptional leaders to join the TMCI bishop team. And lastly, before I introduce Judy Covington, I would like you to know that at every annual conference we take a missionary offering. And this year, we're taking an offering for food for Africa, India, and Mexico. The pandemic is lifting, as I said last night, in most of the countries. But 
the economy in all these countries are struggling and people are struggling to get money for food and it is critical. Early this month I talked to our uh, leadership in Africa and they were saying that there's more suffering over the lack of food than it is they're suffering from the virus. So I encourage you to take in, let God speak to your heart. Because I will tell you, 100% of the money you give will go to purchasing food for these nations. Now I encourage you again to go to at the website, which is www.tmci.info and click on donations and choose missions and to donate for the food project. And I thank you that you're gonna do that. Now, again, it's my privilege to introduce you, Sister Judy Covington, the co-founder of TMCI. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the final service of the TMCI's 2020 annual conference. Um, my name's Judy Covington. You may have spoken to me on the phone and if you did, I probably didn't hear you very well, but that's another subject entirely. Um, tonight you're gonna hear Brother Danny Stain. I met Danny a long time ago, uh, 20, more than 20 years ago. And uh, he's a man of God, has uh, been used by God mightily all over the world. And so I pray that uh, you will receive what you need from God and from Danny's ministry tonight. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and thank you for your servants who are willing to share it. Father, I pray you'd open our ears and our hearts and give us a good understanding of our, of our purpose and of where we're supposed to be. And Lord, that you would lead us always. We thank you, Lord, that you told us that your burden is light. And so, Lord, we ask you to help us to roll it over on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you fear it? Rise to the heavens, it's the sound of praise rising from this place. Can you hear it? Echo off the mountains, it's the sound of praise rising from this place. Can you feel it? Stirring up inside you, it's the sound of praise rising from this place. Can you feel it? It's building up. from this place and we say hallelujah 
You've died for us. What you've died for us.
we thank you for your presence filling this place right now. Spirit of the Lord is 
My goodness, hasn't God been good tonight? We've enjoyed the worship. We've enjoyed blessing the Lord. He has been so good to us. It felt good, didn't it? Well, since we've blessed God, we now have an opportunity for us to bless the kingdom of God. And God has uh, already declared in his word that if we bless his kingdom, he will make sure our needs are met. All you've got to do is look down below and see the website and it will give you your instructions on how to give. And tonight we've got the worship, we've got the blessing to give, and now we're going into the word of God. And the word of God is going to bless you immensely tonight. Open up your heart. Open up your mind. Now, here's the word. Hi, it's a privilege to be with you today. I love what God is doing through TMCI and uh, just know that he's using so many of you to touch people uh, around the world. And I'm grateful for that. I'm also very grateful that there are people that are on the front lines like you who continue to reach people in the midst of pandemic, in the midst of danger, in the midst of difficulty, because that is the call of God on our lives. And I'm so grateful for you. I'm just going to open with some prayer and we're going to um, just go after some, some stuff today. I'm looking forward to, to being with you and um, for the Spirit of God to move on you. So Holy Spirit, right now, we just welcome you. We thank you so much. For the grace, Lord, that you've given to us, that you trusted us, Lord, to live in 2020, that you trusted us to live through a year that for many, Lord, it's been filled with every kind of difficulty. But Lord, for, for us who know you, it has been a year where we've been able to see the God, the God who is in the fire with us that you are the fourth man in the fire and that you have been walking with us. You've been showing us things, Father, during this hour that we have never experienced before. And I'm asking God today that as we um, gather together as uh, in homes or gathering places, Lord, I'm asking right now that there will be a release of your glory, a release of your presence. Lord, that the spirit of revelation would come right now to open up what it is that you want planted and built in our lives, Lord. And you said that, that it is that incredible thing of revelation, Lord, that builds, that builds your church. That, um, that when, when you are speaking, it's worth everything, Lord. So I ask, Lord, you take my words. And uh, Father, that those will be dropped, but your words would be uh, lifted up and exalted. We honor you, Jesus. We honor you. We welcome you here. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to share with you something. You know, the theme uh, that, that I was given was basically uh, shedding your light in the midst of darkness. And it's been actually a constant theme in my life um, for my whole life because I have been one of those who has um, always realized that, that really the vision of the church is, is not to become a social club but the vision of the church is to reach the world around us, that God literally has called us to reach every tongue, tribe, and nation. That vision was a part of what Jesus always carried. Vision is what, a, a, what the disciples always carried. There was always something more that God had for us. And it's very interesting because during these days, you know, Proverbs tells us that where there is no vision, people perish is what most people have, uh, have seen that translation, 
but actually uh, the translation I prefer that I think is is actually more uh, accurate is actually where people don't have vision or where they don't have a sense of what God wants them to do. It says they'll cast off their restraints. They will they will step aside from the very things that God has called them to do because they just don't feel like it matters. Um, but it does matter. And that's why God wants us to have vision. And even during this hour where, where some people have been locked up and locked down, people have been going through all kinds of things. We've had to wear the masks. We've had to do the weird stuff. Um, but the reality is, is that what we're walking into is a world that actually has existed in certain portions of the world for a long time. The, the, the Lord was the one who, uh, who, who brought us to this time. It's not the devil. It was God who brought us to this time. And, and I say that because I have a firm belief that God trusts his people, that he equipped us, gave us, put a deposit of Holy Spirit in us. And as a result, he has trusted us to go through this season of time and to not go through with depression or fear or worry or um, just overwhelmed by what is happening, but that he's actually called us into a period of time that is amazing, amazing. We are living in the best of times, even though for some, it feels like the worst of times. And so I want to share with you today what it means to look for God during this hour. We've had some major shifts and structural changes, if you will, um, where where we are. I live in uh, Connecticut, but we actually have uh, people that are very connected to Mountain of Worship in many parts of the world and around the nation. And um, it's just been an amazing thing to watch God change our ideas, our opinions, our plans and say, it's okay, I've got this. And a few months ago, the Lord spoke to me and he said, Danny, he said, it's very important that you begin to equip the church to function as the underground church. And I was like, Lord, are we going underground? And um, I'm going to share something in just a few minutes about some things that he has shown me. But but I was like, Lord, why are we going underground? What, what, is, what is the deal? And he said, whether or not you have to go underground, I want to share with you the best model of church growth, church planting, and ministry that there has ever been. And it has been the church that functions like the underground church functions in, in several places in the world, but primarily if you look at China for, for decades now, decades upon decades, but also the church in Iran, which is the fastest growing church right now. And people say, well, how... How do you mean? Do you mean like going to house churches? Well, it may be that, but that's not really the issue of the underground. The issue of the underground is the most profound thing that is required of people that are functioning in an underground setting is there's something far more important than simply meeting in a house or meeting in little clubs everywhere because we've been doing that for a long time. The reality is, is that the church has been social distancing for generations. And the Lord is finally bringing us to a place where I hope that we can become one and see what it is that he wants to release. But the key thing that God really wants to release during this hour is not, is not about a house church or a group or something. The key part is actually what Peter would discover in Matthew where He's with Jesus and the disciples. And Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter replies, you're the son of God. You're the Messiah. And Jesus said, flesh and blood didn't give that to you, but my father who is in heaven. You might recall that repeatedly Jesus would say, how long must I be with you? Because the issue for him was not even the cross that he says in John 17 prior, prior to the cross, he says, Father, I have completed the work you gave me to do. What was the work? What was the most significant work that Jesus did? What was it that Jesus was actually trying to release to us? He wanted us to hear from God. 
And the church that is the underground church is the church that understands what it means to listen to the Holy Spirit. That we have to listen to him. That we have to respond to the nuance of God. The underground church functions because the Holy Spirit speaks to them and tells them when, where, and how to even meet. If we didn't have announcements, we wouldn't know where to meet. If, if, if we didn't have Facebook or social media to communicate, we're doing this big event, nobody would know. But what would happen if the church actually became completely and utterly dependent on Holy Spirit? And I believe that's where the Lord is taking us. He's taking us to the place where we become dependent on the Holy Spirit. That's why Peter and John could say in John chapter 4, whether it's right to obey you or obey God, you decide, but we're going to obey God. The reality is, is that Peter and John had an encounter. The Holy Spirit said, minister to this man. Very interestingly, Jesus passed by that man for several years and never healed him. Do you notice that? We don't like that. It was a, a passage that always frustrated me because I, I looked at that passage and I went, Jesus, you came by this guy over and over, and here are Peter and John, and it says that he'd been there for years. So we know Jesus passed by that man, but Jesus never healed that man, but Peter and John would. Why? Because at that moment, the Holy Spirit said, Peter and John, I have, I have a mission for you. Here's what you got to do. And they became dependent just as Jesus was 100% dependent on his father. He says that in John chapter 14. He says, um, uh, he says, Father, I can only do, I'm sorry. He says, Father, uh, I can only say what my father says. And he says, I can only do what my father does, what I see my father doing. And so there's this part of us that we have to kind of go, wow, do we do that? Is that really what we do? I don't know. The Lord has really challenged me recently. I want you to turn in your Bible, if you have it. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 5. And uh, because I want to talk about uh, what it means to really walk with God. Uh, to me, the key of what God has for our lives is not simply operating the gifts of the Spirit, it's not simply the ability to function, whether it be in word of knowledge or healing or prophecy or whatever it is that often comes bubbling to the top as the most important gift to us. But to me, the most important part of what God has called us to is, in fact, walking with God. You might, you might remember that when John speaks to the church, he says, I write to you young children, because your sins have been forgiven. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. And then he says, I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who has been since the beginning. The end zone, if you will, is not to be an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher. The end zone is to become a father or a mother in the faith. It's to carry the wisdom of God. It's to carry the ways of God. And when we carry those things, all the other things will happen. But we begin to understand that the most important part of our journey is not what we do, but who we know. And so this passage that I'm about to read to you, I want you to understand that all of these things are based on profound relationship that we must have this relationship where we understand the ways of God. God doesn't just simply throw something out there and want us to just jump our whole life into a different, a different facet of, of we need to now add this ministry or we need to do this now so that we're fulfilling that little passage and this little passage. It actually is birthed out of the heart of God. It's, it's what God has intended. And so in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, he says, you are the salt of the earth. 
But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can be can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. And this first thing, Jesus is actually pulling in uh, something that was actually done in in numerous places uh, during former battles, during wars, and they would burn the land, is what they called it. And basically, when when the uh, the army would come in and defeat another army, they would put salt over all the other um, land because they wanted to ruin the land. But they wouldn't use the good salt. They just used the old shoddy salt. It was intended to just destroy. And so you could save the other for other savory things. But there's salt that has lost saltiness. In fact, uh, I can be really honest with you. The salt that we use in our salt shakers is, is pretty, pretty tame. It's pretty mild. As a, as a young pastor, I was in North Carolina. And we were doing a conference this, um, uh, this one time. And uh, as we were doing this conference, there were, there were some who had ordered a kit from uh from Israel, and in ordering this kit, they had a um, a tallit, and they had um, all, all kinds of different things, oils, and and everything that they'd order, ordered from the uh, from Israel, and brought it over, and because the Lord told them that they needed to do something with this thing, well, inside of that little uh, kit was also some salt from the Dead Sea, and during worship. We were having this incredible encounter with the Lord. And during the during worship, the Holy Spirit just kind of took me in another realm. And while that was happening, I was kind of lost. I, I The music carried on. And I had my guitar in my hand, but I was not really there. I was, I was in a place with the Lord. And it was during that time that somebody had the bright idea, hey, this is the time where we begin to um, anoint and, and we can use this kit right now while Danny is up on stage. Now the whole worship team was there and they were still playing, but I was kind of frozen. And they came and the first thing they did, and anybody who knows me knows that I, I sweat a whole lot, a whole lot. And um, it's, it's not a pretty sight. You know, I don't look good in a suit because when you get a tie that's all wet and bunched up, it just doesn't look very good. And, and, and when you're hot and sweaty, it's like people are like, man, take off your coat. You look like you're dying in there. And I do. I look pretty, pretty rough. I can get pretty wet. So I was all sweaty and they put this tallit over me, which is like a blanket. I mean, it was like I, I'm now I'm hotter, but I'm still frozen there. Then they took oil. And they rubbed it all over me and they put the tallit back down and they, 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 they oiled my whole guitar and they oiled me on my hands and everything else. So now I'm oily and sweaty. And I'm like, wow, this is, you know, I, and I can, I know that I'm, I'm having an encounter with the Lord, but I also know that he has me in this place where I am stuck. And in this stuck place, I'm like, Lord, what, what are you doing with me? And the very next thing they go, hey, there's some salt in here. And they took a chunk of that salt and they shoved it in my mouth and I couldn't spit it out because I literally was frozen. And honestly, it was painful. As they put that salt in my mouth, I realized I don't think I've ever tasted salt before right now. This is so painful. It was, but but it was hilarious because I'm I'm there and now I'm drooling down my face. It was just a just a wreck. But I learned something about salt. I said, I I get it, Jesus. When salt loses its saltiness, it's no good. And this was not, this was potent salt. This was salt. That would work for a whole lot of meals if we needed it to. And it was just a little chunk, but it was enough of a chunk that it completely disrupted my life. The salt that God has given us is intended to disrupt lives. It's intended to make us kind of crazy. This morning I was out with a couple and it was so wonderful how boisterous and alive they were with Jesus in this restaurant, you know, uh, where I live, they have in the past, I don't know if it's still true, but in the past, they've said that the ratio of Christians in Connecticut is the same ratio as Pakistan. It is the least evangelical state in the nation. So so we're in a pretty, pretty pagan place. 
And we're in this restaurant, and man, they were just so boisterous about Jesus. Talking to, the, talking to each other, talking to us, talking to the, um, the waitresses and, and blessing the waitresses and, and um, praying for them. It was an amazing time. And I was like, that's salt. That's what salt is. But the passage doesn't end there. If you continue on, it says a town built on a hill can't be hidden. You've been built on a hill. You've not been built in a cave. You've not been built in a shadow. You've actually been put for display that Jesus, or I'm sorry, the Apostle Paul basically says that we are his workmanship created in good works for basically it's for his display. That God wants to display us. He's like, he says, I want to show you off to the world what I did. I don't care how bad you were. I can show my grace through you in a powerful way. I'm going to put you on display. And he says, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, your light will shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your father in heaven. That actually the boldness is what God's calling in right now. It's very interesting that in John, I'm sorry, in Acts chapter four, where where Peter and John have just healed. Where they've been persecuted, where they've been beaten up, where they've been tried to be shut down in every way. They go back and they go back to the people of God and they say, guys, do you see what the devil is doing? He's trying to stop us. We can't let him stop us. We've got to go. We got to go, 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 go. <laughs> and they pray, Lord, can you see what the devil's doing? Can you see, Lord, how, 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 how the enemy has tried to shut up the church? Can you see how he's, he's tried to mask your voice? Can, can you see how he has produced fear? So that people will cower, be afraid. There is no such thing as a cautious Christianity. None. Christianity is not cautious at all. It's bold. It's so bold that there are martyrs in every century since Jesus. It's so bold that will go directly up to kings and speak the truth of God's word. It is so bold, so bold, that it will absolutely speak in public places, knowing that ridicule may come, but the truth must be shared. Powerful, really powerful. During the season, one of the things that happened, I, I, I'm reacquainted with a, with a friend that I've, I've actually known for, um, oh, a couple decades, and this man's quite prophetic, and, and we began comparing notes about an experience that I had and he had. We had them in the same month of 2005, and during that period of time, the Lord began showing us things. I was with the Lord in a room in Idaho, and um, it was a very powerful three-hour experience with Jesus, and he had another encounter with Jesus, and, and during those encounters, the Lord began showing us some things of the things to come, the days to come. You know, one of the things about the days to come is we never know when the day is coming until that day is there. And I began realizing some things back when COVID started hitting and, and uh, this pandemic began coming. And it was very, and I don't believe that this is the, the greatest significant difficulty we, we are facing yet in our generation. But I believe it is a piece of something that has been initiated. But what happened was the Lord showed me actually in 1990, I had an encounter with Jesus where he laid his hands on me, he spoke to me, read from my Bible uh, from Revelation chapter 3, and he said um, the passage about the Church of Philadelphia, and he said that basically that he was going to keep me from the hour of trial uh, that was coming on the whole world. And back a few months ago, I, I went, oh, this is what you were referring to, that there's an hour of trial that's coming. 
And there's a piece of that. It's not completely fulfilled yet, but there are pieces of that for sure, that we are facing a difficulty that we never dreamt we would ever have. And the whole world is. Literally, globally, there's something very significant. And so we fast forward to this event that both he and I have in, in October of 2005. And in this event, the Lord began showing us various things that are going to occur in the earth that are quite cataclysmic and quite powerful, so much so that neither of us has really shared those things uh, for many years because we don't want to produce fear. But in fact, in the midst of fear, in the midst of fear is where the Lord wants us to begin sharing some of those things. Why? Well, let me go back to that passage in Matthew where Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he says, who do you say that I am? And they say, oh, some say you're Jeremiah, some say you're Isaiah, some say this is who you are, and, and on and on. And he says, but who do you say I am? And that's where Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus responds and he says, Peter. And I imagine Jesus was probably smiling, maybe even finally laughing, just with relief that somebody got it. And he said, flesh and blood didn't give that to you but my father who is in heaven. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, what a lot of people don't realize is that where that was asked of, Jesus, uh, of the disciples, where Jesus asked the disciples is actually in a place near Caesarea Philippi. And, and the scriptures tell us that this is where this event occurred but until you've been to this place, you don't really understand the passage. You, you have all kinds of things. Well, what is the rock that he's talking about? Is the rock Peter because his name means rock? Or is it revelation because it's upon that rock? Or is it the revelation of what he said that you're the Christ, the son of the living God? So there were three options until a couple of years ago when I was told this story by a friend of mine who was uh, doing a tour and we were there and we were standing in front of this pagan temple. And I said, why are we in front of this pagan temple? I don't want to be in front of a pagan temple. And uh, the Lord um, began teaching me something. See this pagan temple is probably a hundred meters for those of you who are overseas. Um, maybe not quite that, maybe 75 meters, but 250 feet high, maybe something like that. A massive cliff of sheer rock that this temple is carved out. And they would take babies in that area and they would crush the babies on the inside. There was a channel that would come to the, to the outside of the temple. They would crush the babies in a channel with rocks until blood flowed out the front of the temple where everybody could see it. And if one baby wasn't enough, they would take a second. If two were not enough, they'd take a third. And as a result, in that area, there was a incredible fear profound fear that people would be dealing with. You can imagine if, if you lived in that community wondering, are they going to take my child? Are they going to steal my child to, to destroy them? Because this God needs a sacrifice. The name of the temple is Pan. The God was Pan. It's where we get the word pandemic. It's where we get the word pandemonium. It's where we get the word panic. You might recall that Jesus over and over tells us, don't worry, don't panic. Why? Because actually, when you submit to panic, when you submit to fear, you are submitting to, in fact, that demonic God. And that God was, in fact, literally 
in a place where there was total rock. In fact, the place was known as the gates of Hades or the gates of hell. That this place was so feared that people didn't want to go near there because they were afraid that they may lose their own child. But it was here that Jesus would ask the question, who do you say I am? It was here that Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades or hell will not prevail against it. God speaks about finding a footstool for his feet. In Romans, we learn that it says, very soon the God of peace will crush Satan under our feet. That literally the greatest thing we have to overcome in this hour for boldness to be released, for the salt of the earth, for the light of the world, for the city on a hill to be lifted up and exalted, the greatest thing we have to overcome is fear. That fear is not wisdom. Fear is, in fact, the opposite of faith. That what God has called us to is to walk boldly. When you look at Peter jumping over the side of the boat with the second leg, you recognize he overcame fear. You, you, you realize that when Jesus is hanging on the cross and all the disciples are there and their worst fears are realized, you realize that at the end of the day, it wasn't just about them falling away from the Lord. It was not about that moment of panic. It was about the fact that God had to crush fear in their life because without fear being crushed, it will continue to come up and up and up. In fact, if we can't deal with fear, we're, we're going to constantly wonder, am I going to, am I going to get cancer? Let me help you with something. God never diagnoses. God calls us to destiny. You might have cancer, but you might live another 40 or 50 years. The reality is, is you may have difficulties in your life, but the reality is, is that God might have a future for you. And God has never called you to hold on to onto the difficulties that are coming at you. He's called you to hold on to the destiny and the future that he's called you to. He's called you to vision. That's why where you don't have vision, you die. I've been telling people for months now, I've been saying, stop building your casket. Stop it. Stop it. Maybe you're supposed to live to 100. Maybe you're supposed to be like those who says they lived 120. In fact, it says the Bible says that we've been a lot 120 years. Maybe, maybe we're called to live longer. And maybe it's fear that takes us out because we give in to fear. And we let fear crush our hearts rather than us putting fear under our feet. And so we're stepping into a season right now. I just want to make this really clear. We are stepping into a season where the Spirit of God is about to move in thunderous ways. It's going to be wicked on one side. That's what the scripture says. God promised us that deep darkness would cover the earth. He said that there's going to be a release of incredible darkness, hideous darkness. But his light will shine on you. His glory will come on you. Paul talks about that and he says, listen, the glory that's come on us is greater than the glory that was even on Moses where people couldn't look at him. I have not yet met somebody who carries that kind of glory. But I'm looking for the day, not just where I see it on somebody else, but I want that glory on me. I want a glory that shines, that it radiates, and that it produces in people that the fear of God, not the fear of circumstance, not the fear of man, not the fear of government, not the fear of persecution, not the fear of suffering, not the fear of death, but it carries within it the fear of God. We are stepping into the most amazing period of time, not just because the glory is coming, but because God is about to bring a harvest. And he's not just going to bring a harvest to the heavyweights and the people who, who, who have been around for a long time and they, they've walked with God for a long time. He's going to bring a harvest to, to the youngest, to those who have been saved a few weeks, 
to those who have just encountered God because they recognize in the midst of the glory, none of this glory is for us, it's all for him. And the people who are coming in, they're not coming for you, they're coming for Jesus. They're coming to see Jesus. And so we present Jesus. We, we become what it was that he said. He said, I am going to put you on display. I'm not putting you on display for you. I'm putting you on display for me. That when people see you, they will see me. If Christ in you is the hope of glory, you're not the hope of glory. There's nothing in your life that is the hope of glory. But Christ in you is the hope of glory. And God has called you to be the hope of glory, to set forward, set forward on a hill, not under a bushel. It's time to become the blabbers again. It's time to begin initiating the powerful things that, that we know some people will be offended by because they have pushed a compromised gospel, a gospel that says, I'm going to make it safe for you to be able to be around me. I want you to know God is not looking to provide safe places where he's not safe. God wants to be safe. He wants to be safe among his people. He wants to be God who is God. That God, God is going to raise up a generation who carry the works, the wonders, and the ways of God. God is so for you. And he is for you in this hour. And my prayer is that the light of God will shine on you, in you, through you, all over you. That the call that he has on your life and, your, and what he's called you to, to serve him. That you're ministering not to people, but to Jesus. That everything out of your life is pouring into him. I pray that God will come on you. Holy Spirit, right now I'm asking in Jesus' name that you release, Lord, an impartation and an anointing, Father, on everyone who is listening, that there will be a release of your glory, a release of your power right now, right now, right now, wherever they are, Lord, even if they're in a car, Lord, even if they're at a playground with their children, I'm asking God for a release of the light of God. You said that your glory would shine on us. We welcome that. We say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Lord, I ask right now you break off fear, that you absolutely crush fear. Lord, even some of the fears that we've had over what's going to happen with our families and what is going on in our families, what's going on in our communities, what's going on in our cities and in our streets. Lord, that fear in Jesus' name, Father, thank you that you nailed fear to the cross. Thank you, Lord, that you came to deliver us from fear and that you said, that that very thing called fear, that pandemic, that pandemonium, that thing called fear, that you are going to build your church right on top of that. That your church is about to crush fear. Your church is about to stand up and release the wonders of God in this hour. We bless you, Jesus. We love you so much. Thank you so much for being with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you.